100% deal for the Democrats. Do you think it helped me get it passed? Well, who's got the better deal? Do you think it's going to help me get it passed? So it's not 100% what everybody wants, but when you look, the country is going to be stronger. One conservative who's not happy with the package, Texas Republican Congressman Chip Roy, my guest earlier this hour. Let's play it. All this does is bends a curve off of a pre-COVID uh, or a, a post-COVID curve, right? Mm -hmm. Instead of pre-COVID levels, we are now going up the post-COVID curve and we're flattening it out, basically freezing spending for two years for a $4 trillion debt increase. Let's bring in our panel, Fox News Chief Political Analyst Britt Hume, Leslie Marshall, Democratic Strategist, Byron York, Chief Political Correspondent of the Washington Examiner, and Kimberly Strassel, a member of the editorial board at the Wall Street Journal. Welcome to all of you. Uh, so, Britt, folks on the right and folks on the left seem unhappy with the deal. To me, that sounds like a compromise. Your thoughts? Well, yeah, I think it is a compromise, but I, what Chip Roy, Chip Roy is influential. I mean, Ralph Norman, whose soundbite you just played, is not particularly influential, but Chip Roy is. And if he's unhappy, there are going to be a number of Republicans who will go with him. Uh, so I think there may be some more work to be done, certainly to get this passed, and perhaps some revisions may be required uh, to get enough Republican votes to see this across. It'll be interesting to see, of course, what the Democrats are going to do. And, you know, the leader on that side has said that there's nothing in it for Democrats, so I don't know how many, how many votes they'll be able to get. Uh, President Biden will be influential in that, one imagines. Leslie, what about unhappiness on the left? <laughs> well, there is unhappiness about one area that a lot of Democrats, specifically progressive Democrats, were concerned about, and that is food stamps, because this increases work restrictions for older Americans on food stamps. However, there are three areas where this is a win, not just for Democrats, but for the American people. Uh, you're talking about a loosening of restrictions and, and easier access for veterans, for homeless, and for children coming out of the foster care system when they adult out. So I, I, you know, I say this is a win. You know, Mike, a long time ago, somebody who you would all know and I won't mention, very influential, influential person who knows negotiation said, the best negotiation was when both parties walk away, not 100% happy, not 100 percent mad, and they both have to leave something on the table. And I think that's what happened here. Okay. Reaction from Senate Republican leader Mitch McConnell is, quote, the agreement the speaker reached with President Biden sets meaningful limits on the administration's spending agenda. agenda. At the same time, it secures permitting reforms and reinforces the link between federal assistance and work. The Senate must act swiftly and pass this agreement without unnecessary delay. Uh, Byron, your thoughts? Well, I think it's it all depends on how you came into this story. I mean, federal spending has been insanely high for many years, but it got really insanely high in March 2020 uh, with the start of COVID. And in the big picture, what Chip Roy and the other Republicans were trying to do is to try to return uh, federal spending back to pre-COVID levels, to not let the huge emergency COVID spending turn into a new baseline uh, for the federal spending. And, and that they lost. I mean, Republicans did lose on that. Now, for other people, you say, well, if, if we can't do what we want to do, at least maybe we could just freeze this, level this off for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And so far, they do see to have succeeded with that. I want to play for you the message from the White House Communications Director, Ben LeBeau. The White House is saying it protects some of the stuff they've done before. Kimberly, your thoughts. Well, I mean, the fact that that's is what they are reduced to doing is talking about a few areas where, where they were not forced to sacrifice, I think says a lot about uh, how well a job, how good a job Republicans did here. Look, the, the strategy all along from the White House was to jam Republicans into a clean debt ceiling hike, not give them anything. That changed when they unified and came together to pass that bill last month. And in reality, this deal was done entirely, negotiated entirely on Republican terms. So you have Democrats that are essentially saying, well, look, here are the areas where we didn't have to sacrifice, um, glossing over all the areas where they did. So I think McCarthy gets credit for this. Is it everything all at once? No. But is it going to be better than what they had yesterday? You bet. And you have to govern, right? I mean, that's divided government here in Washington. So let's shift gears to 2024. The GOP primary field is filling up, and we expect a bunch more names to potentially jump in in the future, including some governors like Youngkin and Sununu, uh, former Vice President Mike Pence, former New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, Christy Nome, uh, just to name a few. Uh, Britt, your thoughts on 2024 on the Republican side at this early stage? 
Well, this is getting almost, this field is getting almost comically large. And the conventional wisdom is, of course, that the bigger the field, uh, the more it helps Mr. Trump because it scatters the non-Trump vote. The Trump vote is probably set. Uh, uh, and so uh, the idea is you get somebody, single candidate, who can rally the non-Trump vote, but if they're scattered all over the place, you can't do that. However, we are a long way from Iowa. Mm -hmm. and. The field is going to narrow, if, and, and the more candidates you get in, the less money there is to go around, the less support there is to go around. So it's quite probable that the, uh, the conventional wisdom will turn out to be wrong here, and that the, and a bigger field will end up will end up shrinking uh, in the end, rather than uh, rather than preventing anybody from becoming a straight out alternative to Trump. I think at this point in 2016 cycle, Jeb Bush was expected to be the person uh, that didn't pan out. Uh, Leslie, your thoughts on 2024 so far? Well, I would agree with a lot of what uh, Britt just said. I mean, we're more than four or 500 days out. You can't really believe, you know, the polls. And remember, there was a guy named Bill Clinton, and nobody knew who the heck he was, mm -hmm. and he went on to be uh, president for two terms. You know, there's somebody that I like as a Republican, and that is Sununu, if he were to throw his hat into the ring. I think he represents more of the Reagan Republican, the moderate Republican. I think he speaks a lot of truth to issues like, Republicans, you're hurting yourself on abortion. That's not the issue you should be going, you know, having at the uh, top of, of your list. Sadly, I do think, at least right now, and I don't think it's going to change that much, that Donald Trump sucks up all the oxygen in the room, mm -hmm. and therefore he sucks up a lot of the dollars, and he's going to suck up a lot of the votes. If you want my prediction, I would say Donald Trump will be the GOP nominee, and Nikki Haley will be his VP pick, because she is a woman and a woman of color, similar to the opposition, Biden and Harris. On your point on Sununu, of course, on the Republican side, New Hampshire is the first primary state, so if he could win there, that would be a, a fascinating race from there. Uh, Byron, your thoughts? Well, I hope the field doesn't get so big that we have to have those kids' tables and grown-up tables debates mm. uh, to start with. Those were, those were terrible. Let's just have the whole field in one debate. The good thing, I think, about where we are right now, as far as the two big candidates uh, in the Republican race, Donald Trump and, and Ron DeSantis, we can finally get an apples-to-apples -apples comparison, a, mm -hmm. a real race. In the polls, all the way up till now, uh, uh, DeSantis has been an undeclared candidate, and that really had, I think, an effect on his standing. So I think we'll get a better sense now uh, whether he can get his feet under him and, and mount a real challenge, or or whether Trump is just going to stay so, so far ahead. You mentioned this time in 2015 mm -hmm. and Jeb Bush being ahead. He was only ahead of uh, Marco Rubio by, Rubio by a couple of points, who was ahead of Ted Cruz by a couple of points. It was a tightly packed race at that point. Now, not so much. You made reference to Governor DeSantis. He was on Fox and Friends today, asked about why he doesn't wait till 2028. Everyone knows if I'm the nominee, I will beat Biden. Uh, and I will serve two terms, and I will be able to uh, destroy leftism in this country and leave woke ideology on the dustbin of history. Uh, at the end of the day, I've shown in Florida an ability to win huge swaths of voters that Republicans typically can't win. Kimberly, your thoughts? Well, remember not so long ago, Mike, when all the media was telling us that no one in the Republican Party would actually get into this field because they were too scared of Donald Trump? <laughs> That's not turning out to be the case. And, and on that issue of a big field, I think one thing that is different from 2016 is that people remember 2016 okay. and exactly how Trump divided and conquered. There's going to be huge pressure from donors for people to get out and narrow the field. Britt, we have 30 seconds. Final thought from you. Well, my final thought would be that um, the Republican field may continue to grow for a while, but I think that before long it will start to shrink and it will get smaller sooner than we may imagine. Panelists, thanks so much for spending part of your Memorial Day with us. We appreciate it.